So this video will introduce curly arrows and curly arrow mechanisms and how they work in organic chemistry, um, and also how we can predict mechanisms rather than just having to remember them using molecular orbital theory. So it's appropriate for our first year organic chemistry module, and it builds on a number of videos that I've done previously on molecular orbital theory. So if any of the concepts look a bit strange, you might need to go back and watch some of those other videos. So in terms of chemical reactions, um, we're dealing with basic chemical reactions in terms of nucleophiles reacting with electrophiles. So nucleophiles donate electrons. So if we're thinking about the orbitals where our electrons are going to come from, uh, the orbitals have obviously got to be filled or occupied, if you like. Um, so in this case, this molecular orbital diagram over here, I've just drawn some um, sigma and pi orbitals in here. We're obviously looking at these ones down here because these are the ones that are occupied. These are the ones that contain electrons. So when our nucleophile reacts with an electrophile, it's going to be one of these orbitals that donates the electrons. Now, the actual orbital where the electrons come out of is the one which is highest in energy. And the reason for this is if you imagine you've got a stack of bricks or a stack of blocks. So here are the bricks and here are the spaces where additional bricks could go. Uh, the most energetically favorable um, thing for you to do if you want to remove a brick from the stack is to remove the one at the top because that's the brick that's highest in energy. It's the one that's easiest to remove. So this will be the easiest way of getting that brick out of the stack. And if you think of this brick as a pair of electrons, that's basically how the nucleophile works. If you were to remove a brick from lower down in the stack, obviously that would be harder to do. It's less energetically favorable. So that tends to be not what's, what's going to happen. So if we kind of put all this together, what we're looking for in our nucleophile is the highest energy occupied molecular orbital. And we abbreviate this as HOMO or HOMO. So the HOMO is where nucleophiles donate electrons from when they're attacking electrophiles. So if we bring an electrophile into kind of proximity of our, our molecule over here, then the electrons that are going to attack that, elect that electrophile are the ones that are coming out of the HOMO, which in this case is this pi bonding orbital here. And this also introduces us to curly arrows. So curly arrows like this show the movement of electrons and a double headed curly arrow like this one, where you've got two kind of points on the, uh, the head, shows the movement of a pair of electrons. And in this module, that's what we're going to be dealing with uh, pretty much all the time, is the movement of a pair of electrons. So on the other hand, electrophiles accept electrons. And we can only accept electrons into an unoccupied or empty orbital. Uh, remember, the orbitals can't have any more than two electrons in them. So we can't cram any more electrons into these ones down here. So the orbitals that we're looking at in terms of electrophilic reactivity are the ones which are unoccupied, uh, the ones up here. And the orbital which it's easiest to slide electrons into is the one which is lowest in energy. So if we go back to our brick analogy, if we wanted to add another brick to this stack, then the space that we're going to add it into is the one that's directly above uh, the, the place where bricks actually are. That will be the most energetically favorable place to stack a new brick on top. If we wanted to stack it higher up the stack, um, I think we all know what's going to happen to that brick. That's not the most energetically favorable uh, situation, and this brick is going to slide down to the bottom. So what we're actually looking for here is the lowest energy unoccupied molecular orbital, or LUMO. So the LUMO is where electrophiles accept electrons into. And in this molecular orbital diagram over here, it's this pi star antibonding orbital. So if our nucleophile comes along and pushes a pair of electrons into this electrophile, this is the orbital that it's going to go into. So every molecule has both a HOMO and a LUMO, whether they're nucleophilic, electrophilic or, or whatever. Every molecule has got both um, because you've always got filled orbitals, you've always got empty orbitals, and one of them is going to be highest energy, one of them is going to be lowest energy. So if we look at a few examples here, um, here's methyl lithium, here's an alkene, HBr, and so on. Um, your, your HOMO and LUMO will be a number of different things. So if we, if we go around identifying them all, in uh, methyl lithium, we've actually got a very simple uh, molecular orbital diagram here. So if we're looking for the HOMO, we're looking for the occupied molecular orbitals, and there's only one, so it's got to be the highest in energy. So this is our HOMO. In terms of our unoccupied orbitals, there's only one, so it's got to be the lowest in energy, so this is our LUMO. Now, in the alkene, this is the situation we had on the previous slide. So our highest energy occupied molecular orbital is here, and our lowest energy unoccupied molecular orbital is here. Now, they don't always have to be bonding or antibonding orbitals. In the case of HBr, we have a non-bonding orbital here. So this is our HOMO. 
and our LUMO is this one up here. Now what you'll notice is that the HOMO and the LUMO are always next to each other because um, it's kind of the interface of where the electrons are in the system. So if we fill in the remaining ones, uh, that's where our HOMOs and LUMOs appear. Now, looking just at the HOMOs for the time being, your HOMO will always be one of three things. It's either going to be a filled non-bonding orbital, um, i.e. a lone pair. So in this, these two molecules over here, we have um, filled non-bonding orbitals as our HOMO. Or it could be a pi bonding orbital, as is this case over here, or it could be a sigma bonding orbital. So if you're trying to predict what the HOMO is going to be, you're looking for those three things. And this is kind of the order that you should look for them in. So if your molecule has a filled non-bonding orbital, a lone pair, that's likely to be the HOMO. If it doesn't have any lone pairs, but it does have pi bonding orbitals, the pi bonding orbital is likely to be the HOMO. And if it doesn't have either of these two, then the sigma bonding orbital is what's going to be the HOMO. So if we look now at the LUMOs, again, they're one of three things. They're either an empty non-bonding orbital, as is this case with this carbocation over here. They are a pi star anti-bonding orbital, like this. Or they're a sigma star anti-bonding orbital, like this. And again, this is the order that you should look for them in. If your molecule has an empty non-bonding orbital, like this carbocation over here, that's likely to be the LUMO. Um, if it doesn't have any of these, look for a pi star anti-bonding orbital like this. Uh, and if it doesn't have any of these, you're looking for a sigma star antibonding orbital. So that's kind of the order of priority, if you like. So let's look at how these nucleophiles reacting with electrophiles affects the electronics of the system. So just dealing with the HOMO for the time being, so we're looking at nucleophiles, we're going to use examples that have got each of the three, so non-bonding, pi bonding and sigma bonding. So if we expose each of these three uh, molecules, which are going to behave as nucleophiles, to an electrophile, let's see what happens. So starting with the one over here. Now the HOMO is the non-bonding pairs of electrons which are on oxygen, the lone pairs. So if we draw our curly arrow, it's going to come from this pair of electrons onto the electrophile. So if we move this pair of electrons out onto the electrophile, the first thing we're going to do is form a new sigma bond to that electrophile. So you need to form a new MO diagram for the new molecule that you're forming. So this, this MO diagram no longer counts. But let's see what's happened. We formed a new bond between oxygen and our electrophile, because oxygen is where the lone pairs are. But also, the, this part of the molecule has become electron deficient, because it's lost a pair of electrons here. So the important thing to note is that no bonds have broken, because you've pushed electrons out of a non-bonding orbital. We formed a new bond, but no, none of the bonds in the original part of the molecule have broken. So actually, what this forms is this a new sigma bond between oxygen and the electrophile, but fundamentally nothing's broken. And the oxygen is now electron deficient because it's lost this pair of electrons here, or rather it's sharing them with the electrophile. So if we look at the pi bonding example and expose this to an electrophile, this is our HOMO now, the pi bonding orbital. So we're going to push electrons out of here onto the electrophile. So again, we're going to form a new sigma bond to the electrophile. Um, now it's going to be between one of these two um, atoms here which shared the, the pi bond originally um, and we'll come on to how we predict that later on but the point is that we've pushed electrons now out of a pi bonding orbital so the pi bond is going to break so what happens here is we've formed a new sigma bond to the electrophile to one of these two carbons um, but the other carbon is left electron deficient because the, the the pair of electrons that was shared um, as the pi bonds between these two carbons is now being used by this carbon to form this bond to the electrophile. So if your HOMO is a pi bonding orbital, your pi bond will break when you push the electrons out of it. And finally, analogously, the same happens with the sigma bonding orbital. If we show it an electrophile and push the electrons out of the sigma bonding orbital, the sigma bond will break. So we're going to form a new sigma bond to one of these two atoms, either carbon or lithium, and the other one is going to be left electron deficient. So in this case, it'll look like this. And again, we'll discuss how you predict which atom it is in a later video. So onto the LUMOs now. Again, the three possibilities, non-bonding, pi star antibonding, and sigma star antibonding. If we show this a nucleophile, the nucleophile is going to push a pair of electrons into the LUMO, which in this case is the non-bonding orbital on the carbocation. So our electrons go in here. So what's happened? Well, we've filled a non-bonding orbital in this case. So we don't need to break any bonds, right? So 
we're only going to break bonds when we start filling anti-bonding orbitals. Again, we form a new sigma bond between the nucleophile and uh, the electrophile. And because this non-bonding orbital is situated on this carbon, we know where the bond is going to form to. So our nucleophile forms a new bond to this carbon. Now, this carbon's also inherited a share of a pair of electrons now. So it was electron deficient before, and it's now not. So it's gained a pair of electrons. So if we go on to the pi star antibonding orbital, we're pushing electrons into our LUMO, like this. Now, in a previous video, I said that every filled um, antibonding orbital you've got cancels out the corresponding bonding orbital. So we've now filled a pi star antibonding orbital, so it, it cancels out this pi bond over here. So the pi bond is going to break, um, and the electrons from this pi bond need to go somewhere and they're going to sh shift along to the next atom along, basically. So our nucleophile forms a new bond to one of the atoms that was covered by the pi bond, and the electrons from that pi bond have shifted onto the next atom along, which in this case is oxygen. So oxygen becomes more electron-rich. Finally, again analogously, sigma star antibonding orbital, if the nucleophile pushes electrons into there, we're going to break the corresponding sigma bond, which is the bond between H and Br and we're going to form a new bond to one of those atoms and leave the other one electron rich because it inherits the pair of electrons from this breaking sigma bond. So it'll look something like this. So how do these MO diagrams translate into curly arrows? Because you don't really want to be drawing an MO diagram for every curly arrow mechanism that you're trying to do. It'll take you ages. So what I'm going to do is show you a few examples where we are mixing um, the different types of HOMO on the nucleophile with the different types of LUMO on the electrophile. And we'll start with the matched pairs for simplicity for the start for the time being, but I'll show you some mixed examples later on. Now, remember, when you're using non-bonding orbitals, you don't need to break any bonds. But when you're using, if you're pushing electrons out of pi bonding or sigma bonding orbitals, you need to break that bond. Similarly, if you're pushing electrons into anti-bonding orbitals, you need to break the corresponding bond. So, Translating this into curly arrows, your HOMO on your nucleophile is where your curly arrow starts, because this is where your electrons are coming from, and curly arrows show the movement of electrons. And your LUMO is where your arrow needs to point to. So this is how uh, molecular orbital theory is going to help us in understanding um, why curly arrows look the way they do, why we draw them in certain places. So starting off with these two examples, um, the nucleophile is always on the left in these examples, but you might need to predict that on, on your own in, uh, in real mechanisms. So if we look at this molecule here, does it have a filled non-bonding orbital, a lone pair? Well, it's got a nitrogen atom, so the answer is yes. So that's likely to be our HOMO. Over here, we have a carbocation. So does this molecule have an empty non-bonding orbital? Yes, it does. Here it is. So that's likely to be our LUMO. So our arrow needs to start on our lone pair, and it needs to point to our empty non-bonding orbital. And our empty non-bonding orbital is only situated on one atom, so the arrow is actually quite simple. It starts on the lone pair and points to that atom. The product that we get forms a new sigma bond between uh, the nitrogen and that carbon, which is shown in green here. The nitrogen, none of the bonds have broken because it uses a non-bonding orbital, but it is now electron deficient because it's kind of overstretched itself. Uh, the carbon over here was electron deficient. It's now gained a share of a pair of electrons, so it's not electron deficient anymore. It's neutral. What about this example? Does, it have, do, does the nucleophile have a non-bonding lone pair? No, it doesn't. Does it have a pi bonding orbital? Yes, so that's likely to be the HOMO. Does this molecule have an empty non-bonding orbital? No. Does it have a pi star anti-bonding orbital? Yes, so that's likely to be the LUMO. So we need to push our electron from our pi bond onto one of the lobes of the pi star antibonding orbital. And remember that the lobes of your uh, antibonding orbitals are outside the internuclear distance. So one's over here and one's over here. And we'll talk about how you predict which one you attack later. But for now, you just need to push your arrow onto one of them. And then this, because we're filling the pi star antibonding orbital, we're going to break this pi bond. So the electrons need to be shoved onto the next atom along like that. So our product will look something like this. We formed a new sigma bond between nucleophile and electrophile. This carbon over here has lost the share of this pair of electrons, so it's electron deficient. And this oxygen has gained the pair of electrons from the pi bond, which was originally the carbonyl, so it's now electron rich. Final matched example, um, nucleophile over here, does it have any lone pairs? No. Does it have any pi bonds? No. 
So we're left with sigma bonding orbitals. Similarly over here, no non-bonding orbitals, no pi star anti-bonding orbitals, all it's got is sigma star. Um, so we need to push our arrow from the bond onto one of the lobes either here or here of the sigma star anti-bonding orbital. That's going to cause the sigma bond to break and we need to kick the electrons onto the next atom along. So our product will look something like this. So you don't have to just use matched examples. This is just, I've showed you matched examples so we go through all the iterations. But if we had this example here, for instance, you follow the same procedure. Does it have a lone pair? Yes, that's likely to be the HOMO. Um, does this have an empty non-bonding orbital? No. Does it have a pi star anti-bonding orbital? No. So the LUBO is likely to be the sigma star anti-bonding orbital here. And then you follow the same steps as we had before. This is where your arrow comes from. This is where your arrow goes to. And we need to break this sigma bond so the electrons get kicked onto the next atom along. And our product looks like this. So I'll just skip through a few more examples just to show you how it works. All right, looking for what your HOMO is likely to be, what your LUMO is likely to be. In this case, you've got a pi bond, so you've got a pi star antibonding orbital. Right, attacking things in, um, breaking the corresponding pi bond, kicking the electrons onto the next atom along. This example here, do we have any lone pairs pi bonding orbitals? No, so this is a sigma bonding, and we've got a pi star antibonding orbital here. So this is what our mechanism would look like. So even though we've never seen these mechanisms before, it allows us to predict what's going to happen, right? Uh, and that's much better than having to memorize all of these mechanisms. Um, because you can now work out what's going on, even though you've never come across something before. So just to finish up, a few tips to bear in mind when you're drawing curly arrow mechanisms. Um, a few kind of red flags to look out for. So when we're attacking antibonding LUMOs, um, we break the bond that that orbital corresponds to and push the electrons further along. Right. The reason that we do this um, is because it preserves the valence of the atom being attacked. So carbon's making four bonds here, your nucleophile attacks it, and we need to kick the electrons uh, from this bond onto oxygen um, to preserve the four bonds on carbon. So carbon always needs to be tetravalent if it's neutral. If we don't do it, if we leave this arrow out, we end up drawing five bonds to carbon. And as a kind of rule of thumb, if any of your carbons have five or more bonds at any point, something is wrong. You can't have pentavalent carbon in any of your mechanisms. So that's just something to bear in mind. Uh, also, your electrons always flow in one direction. So when you're drawing curly arrow mechanisms, all of your arrows should go head to tail, head to tail, okay, in one continuous chain, if you like. Um, any double headed arrows that converge towards each other or diverge away from each other either show four electrons converging on one orbital or four electrons trying to leave one orbital, which neither of which can happen. So if your arrows um, converge or diverge, something is wrong. Okay. Uh, this is not true of single headed uh, fish hook curly arrows. So we won't come across any of these in the module, but if your arrow only has one of these angular sides on it, that's a fish hook arrow and that's showing the movement of a single electron. That's what we use in radical mechanisms. So for the purposes of this module, we'll be just be using double-headed curly arrows. Um, so any that converge or diverge, there's going to be an issue. And finally, remember, curly arrows are showing the movement of electrons. They are not showing the movement of atoms, molecules, moieties, whatever. OK, so I see this a lot because people look at this water and go, oh, the hydrogen just hopped onto that water. This arrow is nonsense, right? Because H plus has literally zero electrons, not even core electrons. So remember, your curly arrow is showing the movement of electrons. So this mechanism should actually look something like this, because oxygen is the nucleophile, or water is the nucleophile, the HOMO is the lone pairs on oxygen, and it's attacking the empty S orbital on H+. So remember, curly arrows always show the movement of electrons, not the movement of species, atoms, molecules, or whatever.